Hello, on the Media Savvy Award, we love to profile local business leaders, community leaders who have already built themselves a media profile and find out what it's like so that hopefully business leaders like you can benefit from that experience. Our guest today is Dr. Leong Ponam from the Rofi Clinic here in Singapore. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for inviting me over. We're so thrilled that somebody like you has such a high media profile, and especially during the pandemic years when you and your infectious diseases expertise came so much to the fore. Firstly, what is it like actually having the media spotlight on you? It's a bit funny. It's what Shakespeare would say, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness trust upon them. And certainly I had this media opportunity was thrown upon me. There were things to do. There was COVID. Everyone was worried. And someone had to come forward to placate the public, to calm the public. And for some reason, the spotlight ended on me. Yes. And how did you feel about that? Um, I, I must say that, honestly, I am camera shy. I begin off camera shy, but along the way, I build up my little techniques here and there so as to overcome my fear. At the end of the day, for a doctor, it's about getting the job done. I need to push the messages through. I need to gain the confidence of my listeners, and in this case, the public. And if I don't do it, I will lose my patients, or in this case, I could possibly lose the country. Right. So you saw, you saw it as a national uh, responsibility in a sense. Certainly. Somebody was, had to step up. Someone had to do it. National pride, national duty. Someone just had to do it. So as you're saying, I'm actually quite camera shy. I can palpably hear our audience say, no, come on, you're so, you're so present, right? And you've got the energy. So what are some of the techniques or maybe some of the ways that you overcame that shyness? Well, one simple way is I don't look at Mark directly at the eye. I get very worried when I look directly at Mark. I mean, Mark is so intense. He's such a credible presenter. But instead, I imagine there's someone behind him. I look through his eyes. So I'm uh, never focused at Mark. I'm looking at someone behind him. I see. So it takes the stress off. I'm not looking at a charming young man. Yes, he is charming. But he's not young. Uh, yeah, well, okay. And, and, you're looking, <laughs> and you're looking past me I'm anyway. looking past me. And you can't tell if I'm talking to you. Neither can the audience. But it takes the stress away. I'm not looking at a famous personality like Mark. I'm just talking to a statue. Well, you're, you're incredibly kind because you're the famous personality. Meantime, you've amassed such a following. You've, be, you've, uh, you've got such a household name. Uh, recently, in fact, we, we were in an event together launching a, uh, a vaccine. And um, as we walked into the, the Tower Ballroom at the Shangri-La Hotel, you had all these groupies, you know, all your fans kind of uh, came around. So how much has that actually helped you in your business? Very, example? very much. Number one, I'm in private practice. A lot of the cases come through referrals. So I need my doctors to refer the patients to me. Number two is about credibility. When you're up on the platform, out on the media, for some reason, your credibility is much higher than someone who doesn't have any media presence at all. So if I were to tell my patients, you need to take the following medications, immediately they say, this man speaks with authority. I will listen to him. And it's much easier to convince the patients. Mm -hmm. So for my side, it's easier for me to work for my patients to get the treatment much faster. Mm -hmm. And have you had to become like a TikTok, an Instagram expert at the same time? Well, not really. We just kind of worked along it. Yes, I do have TikToks on me. I do. I, I have YouTubes as well. But at the end of the day, it just flows naturally. And Mark, I mean, honestly, we're just doing a conversation. Nothing is scripted. Yes, absolutely. Nothing is you scripted. Can see the tables are empty. So we're just having a nice conversation, and you just pretend that Mark is your best friend. And we start sharing about a certain topic and it goes. And to be honest, you also need a good presenter to guide you along, to help you along. And Mark does a great job because there are certain things or certain topics which you want to touch on. And the presenter, or uh, rather the MC of the event, will be able to guide you through and then you accomplish what you want. Yes. Of course, lots of people still have that fear of possibly saying something wrong. And you in the medical field, and especially at a time like COVID, where there was a lot of misinformation, disinformation around, how did you overcome that concern that I really need to watch my P's and Q's lest I put a foot wrong? So you need to know what you can talk about and what you can't. 
and come up with a good reason why you can't do it. It's, for example, the science doesn't tell us or doesn't explain it so far. Or there's a possibility which we are considering, but at this point in time, we have no sufficient evidence. We will monitor, or you could even say, watch this space. We will get back to you once we have any new information. So in other words, you know where your OBs are, where your markers are, and you do not cross boundaries, and you try to answer within them. You know what they are, especially you are the expert. You are the expert, you know what is credible and what isn't. And try to keep it within your own domain and your own knowledge domain. Yes, and indeed that is obviously what we train in. But still the fear that many people have is, what if I get asked a question that I don't know the answer to? And because I'm a doctor, in your case, right? I'm yeah. a doctor, I should know. How do you deal with that? The best thing is honesty. I think that's a very fair question. And admittedly, I've never really thought about it, but it's worthwhile considering. If you can work out the answer on the spot, you start answering because that three sentences have given you a 10 to 15 seconds advantage to formulate an answer. And the, and the next thing is don't get too excited in throwing everything which you know. In fact, the way to lead the audience through is, is <coughs> like the Hansel and Gretel story. Mm. You leave breadcrumbs along the way. That's it. You know your final destination is here. Leave little breadcrumbs along the way so that the audience will follow the breadcrumbs right to your gingerbread house. Yes. And at the end of it all, they understand the logic. That's very important. If you, if you throw a fact to a person, it is a fact. But when you walk through the whole journey on how the fact came along, they will retain their knowledge much better and they feel accomplished because there's a sudden awareness, there is knowledge, and they say, oh, I feel good about this. Yes. It's not being shoved down my throat, but I accepted it because I follow the gingerbread. Yes, and I've really learned something from Dr. Leong and I'll make my next appointment booking with him. I guess that's the, that's that's the idea. Uh, and you can also then tell whether the reporter is actually listening. Because if they don't guide you along, right? They don't take those breadcrumbs, then yes. you kind of realize, actually, they're not getting it. They're not getting it. And that then helps you also to kind of maybe go back a step or two and, and reiterate the point perhaps. Yes. And one of the tricks which I do use is, um, I like to use a lot of analogies. I like to use a lot of metaphors because it's just easier to connect with the people. And I like to inject humor into the conversation. Uh, and humor must be done in such a way, it must be such a glaring, must be such a glaring obvious humor that people would laugh. And this is to soften the whole approach. Really glad you mentioned that because I do have a lot of clients in pharmaceutical, in healthcare, who say, Mark, this is a matter of life and death. We can't be having any fun. No, absolutely not. If you want something to stick, it must be fun. It must be exciting. In fact, one of the tricks which I learned from uh, Steve Jobs himself, I, I think he's arguably one of the best. He was about to launch the first iPad and says the press coming out and saying that this is going to be the price, it's going to be more than 1,300 US dollars, but we're going to do it otherwise. And you see an incredible picture where the whole price is shattered and comes off as 999. And you have the whole team or the audience, the Apple fanboys that's cheering off away. Yes. That is incredible. Or do you, do you remember the one where it took out MacBook Pro from an envelope? A person came along and delivered a document to you there is a lot of sensationalism. There is a lot of dramatization. And it's very entertaining. Entertaining, and it sticks very well. And he used a word which I really like, entertaining. In complete honesty, who are you competing with for the eyeball time? If you think it's the guy next door or the next press briefing, my friend, that's wrong. Because the eyeball time that's going to steal you away could be a Tom Cruise movie. It could be a YouTube movie or funny TikTok and for some unknown reason, cat videos. People are more attracted to cat videos than the CEO speaking. Yes. Yeah, I, I am dumbfounded. I thought I would have more personality than a cat, <laughs> but obviously not. Well, I think we can vouch for the fact that you do. One final point. 
a lot of, again, a lot of uh, business people in Southeast Asia uh, always demand to see the questions up front. Now, we're just having a conversation. There aren't any questions. And in particular, in the medical industry, I was always curious about this. One of my first interviews here in Singapore, when I was still at Media or RCS, as it was still called then, was with an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. And the topic of discussion was how everybody seemed to be wearing headphones. Right? Yeah. This, is when yeah. the iP- this is when the iPod first yes, came out, yes, right? And, yes. and people were all of a sudden on the trains uh, listening to their iPods. Yeah. He demanded questions up front. And, and I thought, how could I possibly ask a question that a specialist like him couldn't possibly answer? Of course, he'll have an answer for anything I could possibly ask. What's your message to those business leaders, especially those heading overseas into more rambunctious media environments about this whole idea yes. of getting the questions up front? I, I think it would be good if you have an idea of what the topic's about. So in case of the ENT, it's going to be headphones. And very often, they'll be asking you information related to your field. Number two, you need to read about the press and know what's happening in the world, especially in areas which are related to your area of interest. Because there might be some new press uh, release on a new problem, about new headsets, etc. So know about this. And number three, be on your toes. Be expected to be asked unfair questions and ridiculous questions. And I'm going to say, honestly, the questions we should get in Singapore are really quite simple. They are actually quite easy, aren't they? Yeah, go go down to the White House press briefing. (laughs) Oh my God, there are sharks there. Okay, so get ready for and be on your toes to ask to think about the questions and think about questions which you can... Well, think about a filler space, a filler space, such as, hmm... That's actually a very good question. That's the question which I will ask because you're obviously a man on the street. You know what's happening on the ground. So when I say that, number one, I bought myself time. Number two, I played compliments to the reporter. And this way, he will feel good. Hey, I am looking good in front of this interviewer and possibly will ask you an easier question next. And thereafter, <laughs> plan out and think of a suitable answer. Again, if there are, if you don't know the answer, try not to cook something out because mm. the reporters or the press will find out. And the audience will anyway figure it out. They'll figure it out. They're, yeah. they're not too silly. And if anything, there's Dr. Google and they'll find everything. <laughs> so to say, I honestly don't know, but we can talk about it later after the show. Okay. Call to action. What's the next step? What's the final message that you'd like to send to business leaders in Southeast Asia? The honest truth is no one is born to be in front of the camera. You need training. You need a lot of practice. And of course, a little bit of guts. And at the end of it all, if I, someone who's born camera shy, whose feet shakes worse than Tom Hanks when he was doing the Elvis dance, (laughs) hey, if I can do it, you can do it better. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Dr. Leong Ho Nam from the Rofi Clinic.